Oh, yeah. Um, I really want to vote against this. I think uh, we should have kind of a strategy session with you and, um, the, you know, the, the ledge staff. Yeah. Um, because right now, I think they probably have me as a yes, and um, I really would like to go to a no, but um, we need to understand the amendment completely as well. So, if we would get on that, okay? And we're in session tomorrow with the Disclose Act. Call time for what? Committee will come to order. Today's hearing entitled Viral Hepatitis, the Secret Epidemic, will examine the concerns about hepatitis B and hepatitis C as raised by the Institute of Medicine in a recently released report. That report entitled Hepatitis and Liver Cancer, a National Strategy for Prevention and Control of Hepatitis B and C indicates that the United States is experiencing a hepatitis crisis. Many call hepatitis the silent epidemic because the attention is received has not been in proportion to the vast number of Americans it affects. Hepatitis B and C are among the leading causes of preventable deaths worldwide and are the most common blood-borne infections in the United States of America. The Institute of Medicine found that the current federal approach to battling these disease, 
these diseases is simply not working. Uh, the IOM report suggests a greater need for a federally coordinated response to these diseases, better surveillance, knowledge and awareness, immunization and viral hepatitis services. Today's hearing will review that report and will explore how to implement its recommendations. Today I would like to welcome my colleagues uh, who are helping to focus much needed attention on these diseases. Congressman Hank Johnson uh, from the state of Georgia and of course Congressman Bill Cassidy from the state of Louisiana and of course uh, Congressman Mike Honda from the state of California. I'd like to thank all of you for being here today and we're also joined today by Howard Cole, Assistant Secretary for Health at the Department of Health and Human Services. He is accompanied by Dr. John Ward, Director of the Viral Hepatitis Program at the Center for Disease Control. I thank all of our witnesses for being here today and look forward to hearing about progress on this issue as well as how Congress can play a more pivotal role in making sure evidence-based recommendations are implemented. I want to thank all of you for being here. At this time, I yield uh, to Congressman Chaffee uh, from the great state of Utah uh, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for calling this hearing. This is a, an important, vital issue. I, I'm proud that this committee would actually uh, bring this to our attention and, and uh, to hold this hearing. I want to thank the members, bipartisan group of members who are concerned about this issue. I like to associate my, myself with the comments that you made. This is a huge issue. It affects Americans from coast to coast. It affects the world, really. Um, and it's something that we need to pay a lot more attention to. I would like to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the comments uh, from Ranking Member Darrell Issa as he had some comments on this. Without objection, so ordered. And uh, I would much rather hear from the panel than hear from me. So uh, with that, I'll yield back the balance of our time. Thank you very much. And thank you, gentlemen, for the uh, yeah. gentlewoman from California. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, for this uh, exceedingly important subject matter hearing on the secret epidemic of viral hepatitis affecting millions of Americans and their families <coughs> each year. This hearing comes at a critical time. One in 12 people around the world are afflicted by chronic and viral hepatitis, and it is one of the most leading causes of preventable death worldwide. In the United States, about 1,500 people die each year from liver cancer or liver disease as a result of a hepatitis infection. But if we increase the amount of resources and awareness devoted to this disease, many of those lives could be saved. Treatment does exist, and it is more effective if the disease is caught early, but because this disease is asystematic, as many as 75 percent of those infected do not know it until they have already developed liver cancer or liver disease. In response to this serious public health problem, the Institute of Medicine was asked to provide insight into what opportunities were being missed in relation to prevention and control of hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And the IOM's committee found that there is a staggering lack of knowledge about chronic viral hepatitis among health care and social service providers as ri at risk populations, members of the public, and policy makers. And without proper knowledge, health care providers cannot sufficiently screen and treat their patients, and Americans who may have the virus will not understand the dire need to get tested. As a representative of California's 33rd district in the city of Los Angeles, I understand the impact these viruses have on individuals <coughs> and society, and also the disproportionate effect they have on certain minority communities. <coughs> Chronic hepatitis B is a leading cause of death in the Asian and Pacific Islander community. African Americans have the highest 
rate of acute hepatitis B infections. While hepatitis C affects both African Americans and Hispanics at the highest rate, while I am pleased that the Obama administration has taken the initiative to appoint Dr. Howard Cole as the Assistant Secretary <coughs> of Health at the Department of Health and Human Services with the specific task of developing a national strategy for hepatitis, our communities and the federal government cannot delay in ensuring that they have sufficient culturally and linguistically sensitive access to prevention and treatment responses. So I'm looking forward, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the day's witnesses and uh, to learn more about how we can start impacting and controlling these vicious diseases. Thank you. I yield back. Yeah, thank the gentlewoman from California for her statement. I now yield five minutes to Congressman Bill Bray of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, between 1985 and 95, I had the privilege of uh, uh, supervising a county of three million, specifically uh, part of the uh, supervisor's responsibilities in California is public health. And this was the period when um, the hepatitis epidemic s seemed to spread very quickly, the awareness, whatever we can say on that. And with all the discussion that we had with HIV and AIDS and all that other argument, the, the, the dirty little secret was the huge uh, impact on uh, the general population, specifically the working class population uh, of, the, um, uh, of the hepatitis um, problem. And I just want to say clearly, as somebody who was able to be briefed in that period, I think one of the untold stories in this country is that a whole lot of a certain segment of our community, and it crossed racial lines. I think that what happens is so much easier to identify people ba based on the color of their skin, but not look at their social economic group. That group, which includes a very large percentage of the minority community, um, has been disproportionately impacted. But there is a generational th issue here. So I think with these challenges, uh, we need to recognize that there's opportunities. And I hope as we address this issue that we're not blinded by color because it's easier to do that. We look at the fact that there is a social economic group that truly is a rainbow um, uh, coalition in the negative sense. But that it is also a generational challenge. With these two uh, um, challenges, we have opportunities. We have opportunities to focus resources, focus attention, and, and go directly, like a, someone said, the laser beam towards a much more cost-effective, a much more humane approach to this issue. I think the, the, the one thing that hasn't been talked about in the last year when we talk about health care is that hepatitis is the, the um, um, the iceberg that is under the water that no one realizes that our health care system is running full steam for. There is going to be an impact here that we are totally ignoring and is going to have a major impact not just to the private sector but to the public sector and the community as large and we ought to be addressing that. There are opportunities coming down the line in my opinion to be able to address this issue address it with good science, good medicine, and hopefully good politics. This is something we don't see very often in, in uh, this town. But hopefully we can work together. This is a bipartisan effort waiting to be done, and I hope to, we join together to do it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen from California, for a statement. Thank you very much. Any other members seeking recognition? Yes, the gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Chairman Townsend. Thank you for holding this uh, very important public health hearing. Uh, it's valuable because it increases awareness of the dangers of hepatitis while addressing some common misperceptions and related stigmas about the strains of the virus. 5.3 million Americans are living with hepatitis B or C, and an estimated 75% of those are unaware of the fact they carry the virus. Public education is essential. Between 15 and 40% of individuals with hepatitis will develop liver cirrhosis if not treated properly, making hepatitis the leading cause of liver transplantation in the United States. Viral hepatitis causes 12 to 15,000 deaths annually, and approximately 20,000 people are newly infected each year with hepatitis C. Responding to this immense public health threat requires a comprehensive approach 
that reduces the unconscious transmission of hepatitis from mothers to children while reducing the transfer of hepatitis C through needles associated with drug use. Because hepatitis can go undetected for decades, many mothers have no idea they're passing the, the virus on to their children. Asian Americans are disproportionately affected by hepatitis B. Approximately 1 in 12 carry the virus. My district is home to a diverse Asian American population. In fact, it's the largest single ethnic group uh, in my district. We need to ensure that our education efforts are multilingual and address not just illegal drug or sexual transmission of this virus, but also the unconscious transmission from mother to child, particularly for that more vulnerable population. I look forward to learning more from the CDC at this hearing about our efforts to arrest the spread of hepatitis B among especially Asian Americans. Since there's an expected vaccine for hepatitis B, we can make progress in reducing transmission rates. Some individuals with hepatitis C were infected over 30 years ago, prior to proper sterilization methods of needles in medical settings. Others received the disease through illicit drug use. Today, we need to focus on drug suppression efforts and effective needle exchange programs that can and will reduce the incidence of hepatitis C. It's clear that the primary obstacle to reducing the spread of hepatitis B and C is a lack of federal resources. America, in America's five largest cities, we, receive, we provide only $90,000 annually for hep viral hepatitis prevention. $90,000. We need to do much more to prevent the spread of hepatitis, particularly because increasing the awareness of the disease and increasing the use of the vaccine could and would dramatically reduce rates of hepatitis B and save lives in America. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for his statement. Any other members seeking recognition? Now we will move to um, our witnesses. We will now turn to our first panel of witnesses. Congressman Hank Johnson from Georgia has been a leading advocate in this Congress in pushing for more attention to be paid to the serious health risk that hepatitis poses to our nation. It has become a personal battle for Congressman Johnson, and I am thankful he's willing to share his story with us here today. Welcome, Mr. Johnson. We also have with us today Congressman Bill Cassidy from Louisiana. Mr. Cassidy, Cassidy has served his community for more than 20 years, helping to provide medical services for people in need. His efforts in his community included setting up school-based health programs to vaccinate uh, children against the spread of hepatitis B. Welcome, welcome to the committee. Uh, we also recognize Congressman Mike Honda has also been very active in lending his voice to this issue by sponsoring legislation to help combat this critical health issue that affects so many Americans. H.R. 3974, the Viral Hepatitis and Liver Cancer Control and Prevention Act of 2009, if passed, will support the comprehensive prevention measure that are called for in the IOM report, as well as reduce the disease burden associated with the viral hepatitis. I thank you all for being here today, and I look forward you know, to working with you. Uh, it is committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in. So uh, 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 Mr. Johnson and Mr. Cassidy and Mr. Hunter, if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Thank you very much that they all answered in the affirmative. Uh, why don't we start with you, um, Mr. Johnson, and uh, as you know the rules, you know, in terms of the clock, you know, we all that. But we're not even going to turn it on. You know, we're going to we're going to leave you with it because you know, you know the rules. Okay, so uh, <laughs> so we're going to come right down the line, Representative Johnson, then Representative Cassidy, and then Representative Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Representative Johnson. Thank you, uh, Chairman Towns and Ranking Member Issa, for holding this hearing today. I implore the uh, committee for showing leadership on preventing and controlling hepatitis infections by holding this hearing on the federal government's response to the viral hepatitis epidemic in this country. 
As many of you may know, last year I announced that I was on a robust course of treatment for hepatitis C. Today, I'm back, I'm alive, I'm feeling great, and uh, feeling strong, and in the words of uh, James Brown, I feel good. <laughs> I stand uh, here today bolstered by the love and prayers that I have received from uh, family, constituents, and colleagues. I hope that my disclosure last year will provide others suffering from hepatitis with confidence to speak out and educate the community about this illness. I'm testifying today because I know from firsthand experience just how devastating these hepatitis viruses can be on Americans. I'm one of the lucky ones who found out I was infected, had insurance, and was able to receive treatment. A few important facts that I want the committee to be aware of. First, two-thirds of Americans infected with hepatitis are unaware of their infection, leaving them unable to take action to protect their health and the health of others. Second, the only dedicated federal funding for hepatitis is $19.3 million uh, per year for the CDC. This is not enough and pales in comparison to funding for other infectious diseases. Considering these two facts, it is clear that the federal government has failed in its response to hepatitis, and I'm hopeful that this hearing can bring uh, uh, about a period uh, where this trend is reversed. Unlike the majority of people living with infection, I actually do know my status. The vast majority, with estimates as high as 75 percent, do not know that they are infected with hepatitis, the leading cause of liver cancer in America. A recent Institute of Medicine report on liver cancer and hepatitis found that health providers neither screen nor test for hepatitis, even for patients at risk. I'm grateful to have the support of my family and friends, my colleagues and my staff. However, those who test positive often feel stigmatized, making it difficult to encourage people to know their status and get treatment. As with other infectious diseases, a proper and effective government response will lessen the stigma associated with the illness. It is important to note that even with the passage of health care reform, I'm concerned that hepatitis B and C will and can still impact those who have limited access to health care, such as uh, injection drug users, the homeless, certain racial and ethnic minorities, legal immigrants living in poverty, and undocumented immigrants. As a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, I want the committee to know that rates of hepatitis C are twice uh, the, the national average among African Americans. In fact, one in 10 African Americans between the ages of 40 and 60 are estimated to have hepatitis C. I want to say that once again. In fact, one in 10 African Americans between the ages of 40 and 60 are estimated to have hepatitis C. As we all know, African Americans are less likely to have access to adequate health care and would uh, be positively impacted by an improved government response to viral hepatitis. Further, the baby boomer population is estimated to account for two out of every three cases of chronic hepatitis C. As these Americans continue to age, they are likely to develop complications from hepatitis C and cost Medicare billions in treatment, transplantation, and palliative costs. We can and should do something about this epidemic. And I can tell you, uh, uh, Representative Bill Bray, that uh, the persons who I enumerated as being at risk are not 
uh, as you say, as you pointed out, they are not limited to uh, minorities. There are substantial numbers of uh, Caucasians who are afflicted with this uh, uh, chronic ailment. And uh, some I have been working with uh, diligently in the, um, in the um, uh, private arena to bring um, attention to this very uh, serious uh, uh, disease. We can do better for all Americans at risk for and affected by viral hepatitis. With scant federal resources, lack of program coordination, and the absence of political will, Americans have continued to develop liver cancer and associated lethal complications of viral hepatitis because of our inaction with regards to these preventable inf infections. There have been some positive steps, however. Representative Mike Honda has introduced legislation which I support to authorize a comprehensive prevention, education, research, and medical management referral program to reduce the disease burden associated with these costly and lethal infections. This bill, the Viral Hepatitis and Liver Cancer Control and Prevention Act, H.R. 3974, is also supported by Chairman Towns, and I want, I want to thank the Chairman for his support for this important bill. In addition to these efforts, we need to increase funding for viral hepatitis prevention. Despite dealing with an epidemic that the CDC est estimates afflicts 5 million people, the Division of Viral Hepatitis is the smallest funded infectious disease division under the National Center for HIV, Viral Hepatitis, STD, and TB Prevention. At 19.3 million, viral hepatitis receives only 2 percent of the Center's annual, total annual budget. Funding must be increased to the Division of Viral Hepatitis so that the division can mount an effective prevention response and begin funding preventative services. We must ensure that other funding streams support this work, especially as health reform authorizes new monies for prevention. I'm excited about the prospects of Dr. Howard Coe's interagency working group on hepatitis and the development of an HHS national plan on hepatitis. I hope that this work group will receive adequate resources and that through this work group, real and effective work can be done to forge a national strategy to combat hepatitis. Thank you for holding this very important hearing today and for allowing me to address this committee. I look forward to a very productive and robust hearing on investigating the federal response to viral hepatitis and I'll yield the balance of my time. Right. I'd like to thank the gentleman from Georgia for his statement, and of course, I'd now like to yield time to Representative Cassidy. You're on appropriations, aren't you? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> but no. <laughs> Representative Cassidy. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chairman Towns and Ranking Member and other members of the Committee of Oversight um, for calling this hearing. You know, for the last 20 years, I've been a doctor. I'm a hepatologist. Hepatologist is a doctor who treats liver disease. And so it's kind of a confluence of uh, my career to be here in a political life to discuss this. I still treat patients in a public hospital back home, and I can, from my personal experience, verify this affects a cross-section of people, from folks who are homeless to folks who are nuns, folks who are bankers and teachers, uh, folks who are somewhere um, uh, at a more humbler uh, economic station. And yet, they all have a common need, and that's to be treated or comforted. Now, among my clinical activities, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, was founding the Greater Baton Rouge Community uh, Hepatitis B Vaccination Program. Over six years, we vaccinated 36,000 kids to prevent hepatitis B over a 10 parish area. Now, what caused me to do that program, uh, there's an 18-year-old who came to the intensive care unit. They called me middle of the night. She was dying from hepatitis B. In the middle of the night, we helicoptered her out to a transplant center in Shreveport, Louisiana. 
and there to receive a transplant that would cost two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars and if successful it would cost thirty thousand dollars every year thereafter to care for her with the medication and treatment and I thought to myself we're going to spend a million dollars over the course of her lifetime when a fifty dollar vaccine would have prevented this for the amount that we're going to spend for this young lady I could have vaccinated everybody in my community so that's what we attempted to do now let's give credit where credit is due the way we were able to do that in this public-private partnership is that President Clinton proposed the Vaccines for Children's program and Congress in its wisdom funded it and so thereby the the biggest cost item if you will which was vaccine we were able to get from the federal government and then through our public-private partnership vaccinate 36,000 children now I'm a teacher so let me pause for a second to be, I assume everybody has my knowledge uh, but I've been studying this for 20 years hepatitis hep is a is the Greek word for liver itis is for inflammation and so when and viral hepatitis is just inflammation of the liver caused by a virus hepatitis B and C being those causing chronic hepatitis most commonly and folks ask the difference between hepatitis B and C I say it's like the difference between a dog and a cat uh, they look alike superficially they're the same but in reality they're two different animals hepatitis B are two different animals so to speak and they have different ways of being transmitted hepatitis B I like to say to my students so they remember is spread by blood birth and body fluids so it's spread when a mama gives birth to her baby if the mama's infected the virus passes as the child goes through the birth canal the child is infected from the mama's body fluids it can also be spread sexually spouse to a spouse to a spouse if you will um, and um, also by blood so so B B and B hepatitis C is spread by blood primarily now, there's a, a medical word for blood cells called corpuscle so if you're one of my students I would say C stands for corpuscle you can remember it's spread by blood now in the case of B commonly it is spread mother to baby but also it can be spread from ages 15 on because that's one when kids become or adults become sexually active and marry but it's also when they engage in other high-risk activities for the hepatitis C it's typically spread when it, when someone gets a, in times past a blood transfusion so a mama gives birth to a baby a Vietnam uh, a Vietnam soldier gets shot and gets transfused they get infected and and it doesn't necessarily cause a problem right away what hepatitis does the itis the inflammation is almost like a pimple inside the liver a little pimple it goes away but if you have lots of little pimples you have little tiny bits of scar tissue that build up now over a course of a year that's not going to be enough but over the course of 15 to 30 years those little pimples all over the place in the liver which go away but leave a little bit of scar tissue cause so much scar tissue that the liver no longer functions um, uh, we've all seen somebody I like to point out we all I have a scar on my wrist that scar my wrist does everything I want I wish I could slam dunk a basketball but you know it does if, if I wanted to it can do that but we've all seen someone whose arm has been burned covered with scars so their arm doesn't work like ours does it works more like a club it loses function similarly as the liver is progressively scarred a little bit of scar doesn't make a difference progressive scarring inhibits the liver's ability just like it does an arm to function as it should now I go through that to first say that as representative Johnson said most people who have hepatitis C look like us men who are in their 50s uh, maybe early 60s now